Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mike Pesco, a tobacco control researcher at Georgia State University. TOPS is being organized by myself, Catherine McLean from Temple University, C. Sheng from The Ohio State University, and Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will drop from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to, to, to today's moderator, Catherine McLean from Temple University to introduce our speaker. Today, Dr. Kaiwen Chen will lead a traditional single paper presentation entitled, Impact of Vaping Restrictions in Public Places on Smoking and Vaping. Dr. Chen is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Administration at the Governor's State University, also affiliated with the University of Illinois at Chicago Institute for Health Research and Policy. She's a health economist by training. She applies an economic and policy analysis approach to investigate impacts of various tobacco control policies, including pricing, smoke-free laws, and potential FDA regulation on tobacco use and other related outcomes. Dr. Feng Lu, an associate professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, uh, Shijun, is a co-author of the paper and will assist in answering select questions in the Q&A. Our discussant today is Justin White. Dr. Kaiwen, uh, Kaiwen Chen will be presenting her research in two segments. We will have a pause after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. Chen, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you, Catherine, for your introduction. Um, thank you, the, uh, the TOPS committee members, for giving me this great opportunity to share the findings of this um, for this paper. Um, well, again, my, my name is Kai Wen Chen. I am an assistant professor at um, the Governor's State University. Uh, my co my, my co-author, Dr. Feng Lu, um, is joining us from China. He's the co-author to this paper. He's an associate professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, Feng will, will be taking handling questions um, on the chat box. So yeah, um, the title of the, the, the paper is Impact of Vaping Restrictions in Public Places on Smoking and Vaping. Right. Um, this, this study was funded by a pilot grant through Medical University of South Carolina. Um, it is an NCI grant, a PO1 grant, and um, Dr. Mike Commons and Jeff Fong are the PIs. Um, Fong and I have nothing to disclose for the conflict of interest. Right, so, so before um, I start presenting this paper, I would like to um, start off uh, providing the findings of this paper instead of holding off the findings in the end. So this paper found that adding um, nicotine vaping products in the current smoke-free air policies significantly reduce adult vaping. And we found there's a greater effect among the younger subgroups. Um, in addition, we look at the smoking, smoking outcome. We found that adding nicotine vaping products into the current smoke free air laws significantly increase adult smoking. And we found greater effects among older subgroups, males, and those with higher education level and income. So a little bit of um, introduction, um, overview for this um, novel tobacco, tobacco products. 
Um, I know this, this is just, you know, a basic information for this uh, product and um, I will try to keep it short. I know for this audience, it's not that unfamiliar for most of, most of you. So um, nicotine vaping products, they are commonly known as electronic cigarettes. They are also known by many different names, such as E6, E hookahs, moths, vape pens, vapes, tank systems, and electronic nicotine delivery systems. Um, they usually come with different sizes, different shapes, most with battery and the place to hold uh, nicotine uh, liquid. The device were operated by heating um, nicotine liquid to a high temperature to produce um, aerosols for users to inhale into their lung. In 2016, um, the nicotine vaping products are deemed tobacco products and under FDA's regulations. So nicotine vaping products, they are harmful. They contain um, chemical toxics and they are they contain nicotine, which is addictive. However, the nicotine vaping products claim to be less harmful and less toxic than combustible cigarettes. Okay. So as smoking prevalence consistently goes down in past decades, it has been seeing a rise in the use of non-cigarette nicotine products. The most prevalent one is um, the most prevalent one next to cigarettes is nicotine vaping products. So this graph shows you the trends of adult smoking and vaping from 2010 to 2019. As we see that smoking rate goes down, while vaping prevalence um, slightly goes down goes up. All right. So as, um, as vaping continues to become more and more um, prevalent, policymakers started to consider the best way to regulate um, nicotine vaping products. The recommended public policies to regulate nic nicotine vaping products depends on different perspectives, different views on the roles of nicot nicotine vaping products, particularly on the relationship between vaping and smoking. They concern what extent nicotine vaping products can promote um, concurrent use or they can completely replaced um, the harmful cigarette smoking, the more harmful cigarette smoking. The recommended policy also depends on the impacts on different populations such as adults versus youth. So previous studies, um, well, um, this um, issue, they have been several studies investigating the relationship between vaping and smoking. Um, public health literature provide very useful, very nice overview um, of how um, smoking and um, vaping related, how the cigarettes and nicotine vaping products were used. They provided prevalence of various use patterns and study the profiles, the use profiles. They look at the reasons for vaping, the motivations for using nicotine products, uh, the product used to quit smoking or the product used to get a round of smoking um, restriction. And some studies also look at the association between nicotine vaping product use and smoking cessation, quit in in intention, um, quit attempts, etc. And for economics literature, um, it tends to focus on um, the causal link between vaping and smoking. Um, they take advantage of the state level or local level regulations and 
um, adopt an experimental or quasi-experimental design to gauge the causal relationship between vaping and smoking. Quite a few studies study, uh, quite a few literature, economics literature study the impact of regulation on one product on um, the use of the other products. So taxations, um, indoor use restrictions, um, the minimum legal age to purchase, pur pur purchase tobacco, tobacco flavor bins. They are the policies um, economies to look at um, in terms of um, gouging the relationship between smoking and vaping. So a, a lot of studies sort of concluded that cigarettes and uh, nicotine vaping products are economic substitutes. Right. So our study, um, we build upon um, previous literatures on the similar issues. Uh, we focus we focuses on indoor vaping restrictions. Um, we we wanted to focus on, on adults. We tackle the relationship between vaping and smoking. We explore to what extent um, nicotine vaping products are substitutes for or complements to cigarettes. So um, we use tobacco use supplements to current population surveys. We use the most recent data until 2019. We focus on adults population. Um, we investigated um, the causal link between indoor vaping restrictions and vaping and smoking. Uh, thanks so much, Kaiwen. Maybe we'll take a moment and see if there are some questions. I think uh, Hung has been doing a great job um, with the q and I think there's one open. Um, I, we have a question about whether you can identify a jurisdiction where youth smoking rose as a result of youth vaping. Oh, well, that's for, so for was just to clarify our, um, I know I sort of talk about the youth population, but for this study, we'll only focus on the adult population. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so please, audience, uh, feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A. Um, I think what we can do now is just see if our discussant has any questions or comments. Uh, nothing at the moment, I, I think I'll hold till later, thank you. Uh, all right, audience, please. Uh, Feel free uh, to use the Q&A or we'll, we'll continue. Great, I, I think we All can right. keep going. Okay. All right, so um, this is a chart um, I borrowed from American Non-Smokers Right Foundation um, website. So, um, this chart um, gives you sort of ideas of the number of local and state laws enacted by year that prohibit the use of electronic cigarettes um, in their small fee environments. So starting in 20, um, 2009, 2010, several states and local jurisdictions have extended their clean indoor air laws to include uh, electronic cigarettes. So the purpose for um, restricting vaping in the small free venue um, is to protect, protect the bystander non-users from any adverse health effects due to the exposure to uh, vaping aerosols. And that, that there is also a belief that the indoor vaping restriction can promote the compliance with indoor vaping restrictions, given cigarettes and electronic cigarettes are so much alike. All right, so, well, from 2010 to 20. 
19, there are quite a few of variations um, in terms of indoor vaping restrictions in the either state or local levels. And um, this is just a snapshot um, well, indicating the states and local jurisdictions restricting vaping products in their small free venues in 2021. So the colored states, cities, and counties indicating that these jurisdictions were covered by indoor vaping um, restrictions, either in workplace, restaurant, or bar venues. So here's the conceptual framework. We hypothesize that indoor vaping restriction um, reduce vaping through making vaping inconvenient. As for smoking, um, indoor vaping restriction can either increase or decrease smoking depending on the relationship between smoking and vaping. If nicotine vaping products is used to replace smoking, we would expect indoor vaping restriction increase cigarette smoking. On the other hand, if nicotine vaping products is used with cigarettes, we would expect to see indoor vaping restriction decrease smoking. So the data comes from tobacco use supplements to current population surveys. We use um, several waves from 2010 to 2019. So this survey is um, a, a series of repeated cross-sectional uh, data. And it is individual level data. It provides detailed information in individual smoking, vaping, the social demographics characteristics. And the ni nice thing about tobacco use supplements is they provide the, the, the geographic, the geo ge geographic identifiers. They provide the state codes and also the county codes. Okay, so we will be able to identify um, the respondents res residential uh, location. And the low data comes from American Non-Smokers Right Foundation Tobacco Control Database. Um, the law data include, um, include the indoor, uh, clean indoor air laws in states and local levels. They include detailed information in terms of the strength of the laws and the venue, which venue covered, is it a covered by in workplace, restaurants, or bars. And uh, the database also includes information um, about whether and when the, 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 the nicotine vaping products being included in the small free air laws. So we use the information, the law information um, combined with the census estimated population data to create the county level indoor vaping restriction coverage measure. So um, for the sample, so tobacco use supplements to current population survey, they did provide uh, county identifier, but they only re release the county identifiers for res um, residents living in larger counties. So they, the, the data re only release county identifiers for counties with at least 200,000 population. So they, they, lead, uh, they, they shrink down the sample into 40% because only 40% of the sample were identified with county identifiers. Um, and then we decided to restrict the sample to respondents aged from 18 to 54 
again, this study we will focus on the adults aged um, 18 and above. And um, we excluded the respondents aged 55 and above to avoid uh, any potential um, impact from um, potential impact of differential mortality due to different smoking status. And um, we also include the respondents, uh, well, we only include the respondents living in states with state level comprehensive smoke free laws so that uh, we can um, ensure um, the only variations on the law comes from whether adding vaping, whether the, 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 the location adding vaping, pro, vaping products in these more free venues. So for the measurement, um, we focus on two outcomes, smoking and vaping. Both of the outcomes are binary variables. Um, we focus on everyday smokers and everyday vapors. For the primary independent variables, um, we um, the primary independent variable is the county level indoor vaping restriction coverage. So this coverage uh, captured the proportion of county population, the proportion of population within a county covered by indoor vaping restrictions, um, either from at um, state by state level, county level, city levels, and we. Um, we calculated the population, the proportion of county population covered by indoor vaping restrictions in workplace, restaurants, and bar venues. So this index, this proportion range, range from zero to one. Zero means none of the none of them, none of the population within a county being covered by indoor vaping restriction. Why indicates everyone within that county, within a county, were covered by indoor vaping restriction. So this is um, a graph um, shows the, the county indoor vaping restriction coverage from 2010 to 2019. So the coverage is separated into three venues, bar, restaurant, and work site. So we see there's a quite a, a significant um, increase in the coverage, the county level coverage from 2010 to 2019. And the coverage goes up from 2% in 2010 up to around 40% in 2019. And um, within all the years, uh, the average coverage is about 25%, about 20, 20 ish percent, indicating that on average, about 20% of population within a county are covered by vape free air laws um, from uh, between 2010 and 2019. So here's the regression model. Uh, we use the two-way fixed effect model, um, difference in difference approach. We run separate regressions. Um, we run linear probability models um, on vaping, depending on indoor vaping restrictions, smoke, uh, social demographics characteristics. We also control for um, the state level controls um, and time fixed effect and county fixed effect. We run a separate regression for smoking. Smoking is de depending upon um, indoor vaping restriction at the, in the county level, depending upon um, sociodemographics, state level controls, the regulations on cigarettes and electronic cigarettes, for example, the taxation and um, state fixed effect and county fixed effect and year fixed effect. So we should, 
so this is um, uh, the model we um, used. Catherine, should I pause here? Or? Uh, yes, you, yes, you should. That is fantastic. Um, I'll just quickly look in the Q&A. Um, question about uh, non-response uh, from um, Maxwell Chumas. Do people have the option not to respond to the CPS test? Uh, CPS, test CPS. If so, about how many don't respond and are does the non-response seem random? The non-response rate, um, well, the, the CPS, it's, um, it's a very um, widely used surveys. Um, it's widely used um, in economics area, in public health areas, and it's a national level surveys and it has tons of observations. Um, I'm not sure about the response rate, but um, it's, um, I, but well, the, I, I think it's a very, um, the, this, this surveys is very reliable, the data is very reliable, so I, um, I don't know if Fen has that information, but if you go to NCI website, you should find out find out that information uh, for the um, non-response rate. But um, okay, great. Um, I think there's a question here about um, uh, the, uh, not meaningless, but there's a lot of behavioral effect in the results of vaping consumption. So we can expect a less harmful result but not know all of the health effects. And it would be perhaps not appropriate to extrapolate from a simplistic approach. So um, maybe just, I think perhaps this is indicating that there's a um, behavioral response, I guess, would, there, would we expect behavioral responses um, by, on the part of smokers here? Right, so, um, so we, we, we focus on vaping, we focus on smoking and we, we, the, the major we used is um, the prevalence. So we focus on smoking prevalence, we focus on the vaping prevalence, these are the main outcomes for these studies. So um, we don't quite know the, um, the dynamics of, um, of the, the composition of, the, uh, of, of this smoking prevalence. We don't know, um, you know how many of the smokers are dual users, how many of the smokers are you know, switched from electronic cigarettes. Um, we don't know. So, um, right, we don't know the initiation, how much of the, um, Behavioral change is due to the change of the initiation. How much of the behavioral change is due to the, the change in on cessation? We don't know that information. So I will, um, right, so that's something that, well, but you know, this, is, this paper is in, a, in an aggregate level. It's in more like a macro level. Um, although we don't know much about the dy dynamics, but um, this is just, you know, give us uh, some, um, big picture ideas, some sense of uh, what could be the potential outcomes on the um, smoking and smoking prevalence and vaping prevalence um, due to indoor vaping, vaping restrictions. But I agree that uh, the future studies should, you know, dig further um, to understand the, the mechanisms um, of the policy. Yeah, maybe one way to think about it is that you know you're kind of getting sort of a net or average effect and all, that's kind of going to incorporate a lot of these different sort of heterogeneous behavioral response consumers. I think I think that's that, that that's a very helpful answer. Thank you. Um, another quick question um, by from James Frigger, just a question about your measure of uh, IDR. Uh, I think that there's a concern that prep, uh, whether or question whether this will be treated as exogenous in the regressions. Uh, should be we be worried about bias? I'm guessing you're probably going to get to some more discussion about like event studies and such later on. But perhaps you could give a quick answer here. Yeah. So um, we try to control because well, IVR is in the level of is um, in the level of county level, um, and we try to control other um, other policies uh, as much as we can, um, right? Um, and we try to control the the county fixed effect, 
and um, well, that's that's what we can do for 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 this regression. Um, but we keep in mind that there might be other you know unobserved uh, factors within the county which might affect the smoking or vaping outcome. But we we did our best to 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 try to think about what could be the potential uh, bias, um, right? Potential factors that we need to take into account in the regression. Great, thank you very much. Um, Mike, Password, um, how many different counties are in your final sample um, after you restrict based on urbanicity? Um, could you speak to how many counties are left after you make those? How many counties? So I will um, I will talk about that shortly. Um, I think the final sample right. um, only included um, respondents living in the 24 states. So that's uh, another issue that we need to keep in mind that our findings probably cannot be generalized to, to, to the general population in the United States. Thank you. Uh, let's see if we have any, well, I'll let, uh, see if we have any questions uh, from our discussant today. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Um, so I, I had a couple of questions. One, starting with just the data set. I, um, so as I understand the tobacco use supplement, it follows the same respondents longitudinally for two years and then has like a cohort that gets replaced for the next wave. And so I, I think uh, there's a couple advantages and disadvantages of this, if I understand correctly. Um, so the one, one would be that um, there's sort of a three year gap between uh, where you have measurements. Uh, so, you know, you go from 2011 to 2014, for example, 2015 to 2018. And I'm curious, uh, sort of the challenge of, of that in terms of compounding and, uh, or omitted variable bias, just because so much happens, especially in the e-cigarette market over that time period. So, that, so that would be um, one question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, just to clarify that um, this, this is a repeated cross-sectional survey, so they are not tracking the same individual over time. Okay. Um, but yeah, um, right, I agree. I mean, yeah, this is crossing um, 10 years, right? right? The, the data set cross 10 years from 2010 to 2019. As we see in the previous slide, that you know, the vaping prevalence significantly goes up, and the indoor vaping restriction significantly goes up from from 2010 to 2019. And there is a lot of things going on during that time period. Um, so yeah, nicotine vaping products start uh, being deemed as tobacco products um, under FDA's regulation in 2016. Within that time period of time, so I. That's that's a, actually a very good question. Um, we can so for now we kind of sort um, combine every all the years together, but um, we should yeah we should consider doing some sensitivity analysis and um, separate it out the, the data by 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 year and see how the effect change over time. Given yeah, it, some, it seems like you could potentially on. repeat. It seems like you could repeat the analysis in like the National Health Interview Survey if you had the like, restricted data. But um, anyway, um, so so one one other question I have maybe before we move on is uh, it, you you mentioned you're restricting the data to um, places that have comprehensive smoke free bans, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, like why not include places that have partial smoke free bans and pass a partial. Uh, uh, e-cigarette or vaping ban and, and sort of thinking about those, it, it seems to me that like you would still maybe expect sort of um, uh, theoretically ambiguous effects uh, and would still sort of be interesting to see how, you know, the effects might change for, uh, you know, work for workplace versus restaurant versus bar partial bans. Right. Well, that's a very good question. So um, initially when, when we started um, doing this study, uh, initially, we, we wanted to um, kind of uh, differentiating the effect of vape-free air loss from smoke-free air loss and see if there's any separate effects on uh, from different types of laws on vaping and smoking. But um, they, but you know, they, they, this is a quite quite a complex issue. I mean, well, pre, the, I mean, it's it's um, it's already verified that several studies have found that smoke free air loss reduce reduce smoking, right? So what what for this study we just well we wanted to do one at a time, right? So it has been believed that smoking air loss significantly reduce smoking. We wanted to see whether or not adding 
e-cigarettes, but adding nicotine vaping products into the current smoke-free air laws would additionally increase or even well, or diminish the, the, the effect on the, the reduced um, smoking. So we so well, um, that that's that's I, I think yeah I, I take your comments but for now we we tend to like you know doing things one at a time trying to tease out um, like a small difference um, on the law coverage whether or not at nicotine vaping products were included how would that impact the vaping and smoking. Um, I think it's it's easier to um, I think the findings will will we will be easier to interpret. But yeah, I agree with you that the next step could be, you know, like look at the smoke free air law and see how the smoke free air law impact vaping. Right? How does, right? and adding the smoke, adding e-cigarettes, um, nicotine vaping products, how would that further impact the, the, the vaping prevalence? But anyway, that's, it's, it's, I hope I answer your questions, but that's, that's um, the intention for this study. We wanted to, you know, keep things clean and trying to identify uh, the vape-free air law effect. Great, thanks so much. I think in the essence of time, we'll have to move along because we've got about 23 minutes left and I know you've got a lot of stuff to show us. So thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the results. Right, so this is the effect of indoor vaping restriction coverage on adult vaping. So we run separate regressions. We throw in um, the indoor vaping restriction coverage by dif in, in different venues, one at a time in the regression. And um, for the model one and model two, um, both of the models um, control for year and county fix effect. And the model two, we add the county trends, the county time trends. Okay. And what we found is the results are quite consistent. Um, right, I, are, are, are quite consistent. We found that indoor vaping restriction coverage significantly reduced vaping. Okay. Um, right, so, right, so in terms of magnitude, um, yeah, we've, well, that's, what well, well, in terms of how do we interpret the magnitude, um, the, for example, for on, on model one, negative 0 0.005 indicates that um, if indoor vaping restriction in the bar venue increased from 0% to 100% would decrease uh, vaping prevalence by 0 0.1, 0 0.5 percentage points. All right, so we sort of convert the, um, the magnitude into the percentage. Right. So, well, it seems the, 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 the effect size is, is quite large and Feng and I were thinking about what, how do we um, interpret the results since the effect look quite big. But well, keep in mind that, you know, during the, this time period of time, the indoor vaping restriction coverage is quite low. It's about 20%, 25%. So this probably exam it, it, well, and the effect indicates well, the effect indicates um, the behavior change is due to the coverage change from zero percent to the full coverage. So that probably explains why um, we got quite a big, quite a big um, IVR effect. But we tried different model specifications and we found um, right, the IVR coverage, indoor vaping restriction coverage significantly reduced vaping. Right. But uh, for the dependent mean, um, the average is quite low, right? But I just wanted to clarify that for, we only focus on everyday vapors. So that's why we only have 1% uh, vaping prevalence compared to the national, uh, the, the national public reports, which is about three and uh, two, two and three uh, percent. Right. 
So for the smoking, right, so for the smoking, um, we found quite a bit of substitution effect. We found the increase of indoor vaping restriction significantly increase um, smoking prevalence by 1%. Um, but um, yeah, once we control for county time trends, the significance goes away. But the coefficient is quite similar, right? The coefficient from model two is quite similar to model one, indicating that right, adding the trends um, really burst out the standard errors and making the, 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 the significance goes away. But the bottom line is, um, you know, once we control county, county time trends, the results becomes non-significant, non but the coefficient is still positive. We can rule out the potential substitution between um, smoking and vaping. All right, so what we further um, divide the, the sample by, by um, age and gender, we found that um, the effects were, well, this is adult vaping, the reduced, the, the adult vaping, the reduced vaping, the results were driven by younger age subgroups. Right. So the indoor vaping restriction significantly reduced vaping only among the younger age subgroups, but not older age subgroups. And I think these results are very consistent to what have been found um, because for um, the, 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 the taxation, cigarette tax, cigarette clean oil laws, uh, they found um, larger effect on reduced smoking is coming from the younger subgroups. So younger subgroups they are more sensitive to policy changes. Um, and that's what we found. And these are, I believe these are very consistent to what previous studies found of the previous studies focus on different type of policies. For smoking, um, here's the heterogeneous effects of IVR coverage on adult cigarette smoking. Um, we found that um, the substitution effect are are larger um, among older subgroups and among male population, male subgroups. Right. Um, right, so, you know, age 36 to 55, um, it's the older subgroups that, that might be the stage for smokers to consider quitting and Right, so this is probably the reason I can think of that the substitution effect is so, is larger um, compared to the younger subgroups. And we found higher education level subgroup respondents with higher income, respondents with higher education attainment, um, I have significant substitution effects. The indoor vaping restrictions significantly increase their smoking um, prevalence. So in terms of internal validity, right, um, we provided, we tried several tests to rule out the potential threats to um, internal validity for our study design. We confirm that treatment group and control groups are comparable prior to the treatment. We confirm that um, the smoking prevalence, vaping prevalence, the difference among the outcome difference between treatment and control groups before intervention are consistent over time. And we also test the dynamics of indoor vaping restriction and smoking and vaping. 
we didn't find any significant um, lag effect or leading effect of indoor vaping restriction. Um, in terms of externality, um, external validity, um, how generalized our findings are, uh, keep in mind that our sample only restrict to those who live in larger counties, um, aged from 18 to 54, and living in the states with comprehensive smoke-free laws. Okay. Um, this is, um, so our studies apparently cannot infer, um, generalize to the, um, to the, to the, to, to the overall U.S. population. And just for your information, the respondents are coming from these 24 states, right? Because these 24 states um, have um, comprehensive smoke-free laws between, well, any, during any time point, at any time point between 2010 to 2019. We also did um, several robustness checks. We conducted private models and we confirmed that the, the results are quite consistent, are very consistent to what um, our study but uh, the findings for our studies, we included the self-respondent sample weights. And we focus on the venue specific vaping restriction and those covered by such law. So we did um, a sensitive analysis to by looking at the current employees and um, seeing whether the indoor vaping restriction in the work site influenced their vaping or smoking and smoking. And we confirm that the results are quite consistent to what we, we found for this study. All right. So the limitation, well, externality is the issue uh, for our study since tobacco use supplements only release county residency for those living in larger counties. And we only include states with comprehensive smoke free laws. And um, again, as I said, we don't know much about the mechanisms um, through which indoor vaping restriction influence smoking or vaping. What we know is just the overall the average effect, but we don't know much about um, the change of patterns. Right. Um, for example, whether the increased smoking is due to the decreased cessation or the increased initiation, we don't know. We don't have what well, we don't know much. We don't know much about this. So for the future studies, um, yeah, we should uh, dig a bit further um, in terms of the mechanisms. And I believe that a future study should benefit, may benefit from using the longitudinal surveys and study how indoor vaping restriction um, change the detailed tobacco product use patterns. Right, so for the conclusion, um, so our study heights light the essence of interplay uh, among use, um, of cigarettes and electronic cigarettes, um, we there's oh I we 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 provide some insights for the potential unintended um, indoor vaping restriction effect on increased smoking, and the effects are particularly among certain um, subgroups. So we hope that our study can provide some insights for policymakers to consider as they develop policies and regulations on vaping, um, nicotine vaping products. All right, so this is what I have for today. And wonderful. I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, these are was a really great presentation. Um, I think we have a couple in the Q&A um, and then uh, uh, audience members, please feel free to ask other questions. Um, uh, the one question from uh, Karen Garlick, why would the observed effect differ for those states not included in the analyses or proportion of the US population is covered by the 24 states in the study? The population covered, mm, right. 
it's well, we we don't know we don't know um it's yeah the the well based on the results what well, we can well we these these are the 20 So these are the 24 states uh, we included in our sample. Um, so I would say, well, look at the states. I It seems they are, you know, a lot of the states are quite big and um, a lot of the states are, um, I would say probably a lot of the states are more um, anti-smoking per, per se. So um, I, I, you know, I don't, well, it's, Right. So, um, right. We well. That's how would that how would that impact? Um, how would that make the role on on the effect of um, the results of our the our findings? Um, well, I don't know. Um, but that's um, well. That's a great, good question. But that's that's um, I well. That's something we we should think about. Um, but uh, based on the findings, well, we don't listen not much we can address about but if we included other states in our sample what would that um, change the change the outcomes but um, yeah so uh, uh, there's a well they, our sample also um, include um, respondents in, in in larger counties and excluded the the, res the respondents living in the smaller counties and so apparently we are excluding um, respondents in in the rural areas and um, right so that is something we, that we, we we should think about um, in terms of the the, the the generalizability of our findings I mean for the rural areas um, I would say the vaping prevalence is quite small um, the coverage, the indoor vaping restriction coverage um, is small. So based on um, the, the experience from um, small free air laws, rural counties, the rural areas are less likely to be covered by small free air laws. So, right, so how would that impact the results, right? Um, yeah, I need to think about that. Thank you. I mean, my guess would probably be you're, you're focusing on a sample of you know, probably more progressive states and you've got more urban areas. So maybe even hazarding a guess that perhaps effects might be larger if you were looking in less progressive states in terms of tobacco control. And just a hazarding a guess. I think it'd be a really interesting thing to kind of conjecture. Um, so a great question audience from the audience, as, as usual. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. Um, okay. Uh, I think there's just a follow up, perhaps. Um, uh, I think Karen. Glenn, Gerlach is maybe suggesting that perhaps maybe the, the effects may, may be more homogeneous than I'm conjecturing, but something interesting to think about. Uh, just to see if we have any questions from our discussant. Uh, Justin, do you have any other comments on the paper? Yeah, thanks, Kellen. This was really a great presentation. Um, I thought it was a, just, just a few comments. Um, I thought the finding of substitution toward um, increased smoking um, is really important. And I appreciated the um, caution you, you gave in terms of the generalizability um, because of the sample restrictions. And, and I think that is important to, to note uh, sort of along the lines of, of the, um, that last question that it does seem because of the, the age restriction to uh, people who are under uh, 55, as well as like the sort of 60% of rural people being, uh, so, so the, sorry, over 55 being dropped as well as the rural areas being dropped. Um, you know, I, I think if we were to scale up to, to population wide, it would probably be, you know, less than the one percentage point that it seems like you're estim estimating in terms of the increase in smoking, but nevertheless, that substitution is hugely important. Um, it did raise one question for me about whether you could use as a placebo test, perhaps using um, individuals who are over age 65 in terms of their smoking. It seems like they, you know, their vaping rates are really low, I think like less than 1%. And so I, I, that might be a, a sensitivity analysis that you could think about. Yes, that's, that's, that's a very great comment. Thank you, Justin. Um, I also thought that the um, analysis by venue was pretty interesting. Um, uh, in particular, you know, I would have expected the workplace 
restrictions might have the biggest impact on people's um, uh, vaping just because uh, more time is spent at work at, um, in, relative to bars or restaurants. And so I, 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 I know, just, just a comment, but I, I thought that was um, in particular interesting, the, the by venue analyses. I did wonder um, whether it would be possible to stratify the vaping analysis by smoking status and the smoking analysis by vaping status. It's sort of an endogenous variable, I suppose, but it, it could be interesting for seeing like the effects on um, dual users. Um, and I, I'd be curious if you if you think that might be uh, feasible to pursue. Yes, we can do that. That's a great comment. And then I would also uh, recommend that you do this, the stratified analyses, but it would be interesting as well to just run interaction models um, just because by, by those stratified variables, just to see if there are significant differences between say, it, I, I think the age group, it looks like there probably would be s significant differences by the older versus younger, but some of the other ones, it's sort of a little bit harder to tell. And I think if you, within interaction models, you can sort of formally test that. So that's sort of just a pet peeve of mine, but just a, a suggestion. Um, and, and then finally, I, I was just curious if you could just talk a little bit more about how you did the lagged or leading effects analysis, just because, again, like because the tobacco use supplement is so infrequent, I wasn't sure sort of what that six or 12 month gap um, uh, or lag or lead analysis involved. Right, so what we did is, because um, we wanted to ensure that the, the law happens prior to the behavior change, right? So what, um, but well, that is, well, well, the reason why we're doing that is we wanted to rule out the reverse causality, right? Which means um, smoking, the behaviors influence the likelihood of um, passing uh, 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 the the the, the um, vaping um, air loss, um, the vape free air loss. So, um, so what we did is we, right? We we. Right, we 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 let the 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 law happens. Um, well, the behaviors, the outcome happens before the 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 law to 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 see if there are any significant results. Right, and that's how we do the 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 um the leading effect. So we, well, yeah. basically, we just wanted to rule out the the potential reverse causality issues from um smoking to um indoor vaping restriction. Okay, that's it. Um, th thanks so much, Kaiwan. Great mm -hmm. paper. Uh, thank you, Justin, and uh, for those questions, and thank you, Kaiwan, for the great answers. Uh, do we have any other questions from uh, the audience members? I think uh, I think Fung has done a fantastic job handling the Q and A. So thank you. Um, I think we have finished on time, unless there's any other questions yeah. from. Great, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ching, for the presentation and to the moderator and discussant. Finally, thank you to our audience of 130 people for your participation. Thanks again for participating and have a top snatch weekend. <laughs>